I'm going to talk today about the Satsuki azaleas and this is the time I'm going to repot. I'll explain to you about repotting the azaleas because there's a lot of misunderstanding and controversy in fact about when you should repot Satsuki azalea. For those of you who are fairly new to the bonsai game and especially the Japanese bonsai, this Satsuki or is spelled S-A-S-S-U-K-I. The Japanese pronounce it Satsuki. That means the U is not pronounced. So if you say Satsuki, they may criticize you. And those people who pride themselves in knowing a smattering of Japanese will say that Satsuki is not the right way to pronounce. They say Satsuki. Anyway, whatever it is, we all know what we mean. This is a very large Satsuki azalea. Satsuki azalea come in different styles. You get some which are thin and lanky, but they're grown mainly for the unusual flowers. Some of them have thick trunks like this. And because I like thick trunk trees, this is one that I imported from Japan way back in 1990, one of my very early trips to Japan to buy trees. And this, of course, is not my tree. Like most of the trees that come to me are customers' trees. And He's put a label 80 years. I think it could be that, or it could even be more. Look at that trunk. If it's been in this country for the last 30 years, since 1990, and it has grown maybe another couple of inches, but the trunk has always been thick. So this is a big old tree. Uh, I can't remember what the variety is. When it comes into flower, I'll know. And it's in very good health, but I haven't repotted this tree for maybe four or five years. So it's time it had a repot and it's growing very well. All the customer does is that he keeps it watered and enjoys it, deadheads the tree when the flowers are finished and that's all he's done. But I now need to do some radical work. Let me just explain a little about the repotting of Satsuki azalea. If you go to Japan and speak to Satsuki growers or read Japanese books, they always say you repot them when they have finished flowering. I used to go to Japan in the first week in June, stay for two weeks. So by the middle of June, uh, the rainy season starts. Those of you who've been to the cent center of uh, Japan around the uh, Tokyo and Saitama areas will know that the, re uh, the rainy season starts reasonably on time, around the middle of June. June the 15th is the start of the rainy season. And that's when these uh, satsukis are repotted, at the start of the rainy season. If you try to do this in the UK, Europe or America, I reckon it doesn't work. Many people copy what the Japanese do slavishly without considering the differences in climatic conditions that exist in their own countries. So in Japan, they are able to repot Satsuki azalea very conveniently after flowering in the middle of June, from June to July, because that's when the rainy season or the monsoon starts. And with heavy rains, if you repot and put it in a tunnel where there's a lot of heat and a lot of moisture, almost 100% humidity, the trees will grow like the clappers. It will not stop growing. So it's quite safe to repot it then and you can prune quite hard. I spoke to several Satsuki growers over several years that I used to go to Japan. And if you do ask them questions, and if you have a good interpreter, they will also reveal some secrets that not many people know about. And that secret is that many of these Satsuki azaleas are repotted in the very, very early spring. And they do it in February, about the same time as we are in here now. This is the 27th of January. So they usually do it in early February. So I reckon it is quite safe to do it then. The reason being, if you do it then, you can prune it quite hard. You can even prune it back to the bare trunk and let all the new branches grow again. But if you prune hard, you may not get the flowers in this flowering season of the current year. That means if I prune hard now, I won't get flowers 
in May and June. So you have to sacrifice some of the flowers. But many of the Satsugate growers use the winter or the early spring repotting because they can get some very hard pruning done and also get the tree to regrow in the fashion they want and also do the repotting at the same time. So nowadays I have stopped doing the repotting in June and July. I used to do it at first when we started importing uh, these azaleas but I suddenly realized that it may not be the right time to do it in the UK because in June and July in the UK we have a lot of hot sunshine and very dry weather so that doesn't fit or that doesn't suit not that it'll kill the tree but it doesn't do it any good so for those of you who live in the northern hemisphere of Europe and in North America where it's very cold uh, you have temperate climate then do not do it in June and July it is not the right time to do it in Japan you'll get away with it but not in uh, cold tempered countries of northern Europe. So I'm going to uh, now start doing a little bit of pruning and I will show you the repotting as well because there is a special soil which is needed for repotting azaleas. So before I prune you, as you can see, although it's very healthy, it's lost a bit of shape. So my basic shape is always a slightly dome shape. So I have a vague idea as to what I'm doing. So these are going to be used for cuttings. I don't want to waste anything. So you'll see how the shape emerges. Every now and then you need to do it, otherwise you will lose control of the shape of these trees. The shape I like to keep most of my bonsai is the traditional beehive shape. And when I've finished with it, you will get to understand what the beehive shape looks like. I'm just pruning to the outline. I'm not bothering to go into the tree just yet. I will go into the tree, but I'm just pruning for the outline. Get the outline right and the rest will follow. And of course, because this hasn't been pruned much over the last few years, I need to go in and get a lot of the dead off. Now this was a branch, but I think it's a bit low. So I will take this off. And then use a lopper. It's too low, it's hiding the beautiful trunk. And then this one also, it is too close to the other branch. branch because it's too close to the other one. Okay, so, and then this branch, if you ask me, do I need it? It's hiding the beautiful trunk. So, my answer is that I don't need it. So, there you are. I've opened it out so you can see that beautiful trunk again. Being able to see the trunk is very important. And then all these little dead ones. There are uh, quite a few dead twigs, so most of the work is going to be cleaning the dead out.
people don't realize how important the light factor is. If you don't let light in, you'll get quite a lot of dieback. So all these little bits of dieback is from not having enough light going into the inside of the tree. And many of these branches are springing upwards. I may have to do a little bit of wiring to flatten the pads like that. A lot of these little twigs which are dead from lack of light that will take at least a couple of hours but I know you asked me to film everything that I do but I really think it can be boring I don't want to lose your goodwill See how the branches have sprung up. You see, all that should have been a flat pad. So this will have to come out. So we are almost doing like structural pruning to get the structure back right. Now let's go to the back, and you see on this side how far it's grown at the back. So all that is redundant. So we've got to get that. Sometimes our customers are just concerned about having lots of nice flowers and so long as the tree is reasonably healthy they're not worried but there comes a point when you have to do something drastic or the tree will become so unkempt that it ceases to be bonsai. See there's quite a lot of dieback so all the dieback is in the middle from lack of light. When you grow such a azaleas in Western Europe and North America and the cold temperate regions, you will get uh, the leaves shedding leaves. So although the Satsuki azalea is semi-evergreen or largely evergreen, they do shed leaves in the winter. So if you get some leaves being shed, don't worry, it's quite normal for it to do that. As far as I can remember, this tree is usually absolutely covered in bloom in June. But by doing this, I may not get so many flowers this coming year, but at least I will have brought it back to shape. I'm rotating the tree right round and from every angle, certainly from the full frontal and from the back and from the 90 degree side, I should get that dome or beehive shape. So that's how the shape has been created. And this one, you can see how the beehive shape, now that's a bit out, so take these off. So what I've done so far is, as I would describe it, no more than sophisticated topiaries. I know people don't like to use that word, but let's face it, that's what it really is. So 
So I've opened up the tree and I've created that shape. I want you to take this off, it's a bit wrong. Let it go again. So that is the shape I've brought back. So you can see how much I've taken off. I've taken off a lot. So there you are, if you pan in, look at all that pruning. That's a lot taken off. And it's still fairly dense. So the next stage would be to go right in the middle and take out these little bits of dead. As I said, I'm going to spend the next couple of hours doing this. So you can see all these little dead bits. Very, very boring exercise. But it has to be done. Just keep the live bits. So I have to just meticulously go right inside and find the dead bits and take every single one out. And once I've done that, I will clean this up, brush it up, and then we will get into the repotting aspect. So the next stage will be for me to clean it out okay. and repot. We're now going to have a go at repotting it. So we're going to take the wire out here. I've got a little pair here. Have you got yours? The tree is tied in, so we cut the wires off. And because this is not an in-curved pot, it shouldn't be too difficult to get it out. So let's have a go. Let's take it off the front end. Yeah. Okay, you two. Okay, we tilt it this way. This way. There you are. Okay, let's put it on the edge of the pot and let's have a look closely to see how the roots are performing. So if you look closely, these very fine roots have come to the edge and I wouldn't say it is badly pot bound. It wasn't done long ago. Huh? No, so it's not that pot bound. So, in fact, but since we've got it here, we might as well do it because I want to show how we mix the moss. Okay, let me explain why this portion is dark. This dark portion is where we put the fertilizer and where the leaf mold and dust has fallen. So that is not the actual soil. But the actual soil is in here. This is a mixture of kanuma and a bit of akadama and all that. And because Satsuki azaleas have such fine roots, if you use a heavy soil, it doesn't do the tree any good. I'm not saying the tree will die, but it won't grow strongly. So you need a very open soil. And that's why we use this kanuma and moss. So if we now ask our colleague Steve to show you how we mix the kanuma and moss, that will be another valuable lesson for you. So this is the soil we use for repotting or potting up Satsuki azalea. It's kanuma soil. And Kanuma is this very light soil. It is so light, it's almost like, uh, I wouldn't even say it is like pumice, but it's almost like polystyrene grains, it is so light. And if you crush it, it will crush and break. It's white inside, almost white. And apparently it is mined deep underground in an area of Japan called Kanuma. That's why it's called Kanuma soil. And the Japanese have always uh, used a mixture of kanuma and 30%, that means one third, the sphagnum moss. Sphagnum moss, as I've always told you, we buy this from wholesalers and it comes apparently from New Zealand. So we put 30% of this moss in with this. So I will ask Steve to show you how to mix it.
So if, I don't know whether you noticed what Steve was doing. When he was mixing the Kanuma soil, he was actually cutting these long strands of the sphagnum moss with scissors. So you get a better mix. So that's what you could do. And then have a completely homogeneous mix of the moss and uh, the Kanuma soil. And in fact, this moss is such good stuff, you could almost plant it completely in moss. But I think 30%, uh, one third moss and two thirds Kanuma is all you really need for a perfect mix. So let's continue to show you what we're doing here. So over here, I'm gonna take all this dirt off from the top. Might as well start from new. If Steve, if you can do that side for me as well. So as I said, all this dark stuff is the fertilizer. We put rapeseed fertilizer to feed the tree. And as it deteriorates, the surface is this dark color, but the actual soil is in there. And you notice some of these Japanese soils are so good that the grains are still intact. After about three or four years, the grains are still perfect. None of them have become dust. So that's the reason why some of these imported Japanese soils are so superior to anything that we use. So I'm just going to give it a very light teasing. And in Japan, I have seen in June when I used to go there, they used to jet all the roots off with a pressure washer and just get back to the bare roots. I don't have the courage to do that because I think that it will damage the tree somehow, stress the tree too much. If you can kindly lift this up, you can just do this edge, put it on the edge of the pot. No, I mean, if you just sit on the edge, we will tease the edge. Tease the edge, yeah. That's enough. Let's spin it around. bit from the bottom as well. Look at the granular structure. It's all intact, so none of it has deteriorated. Okay, if we take it away, we prepare the pot with wire. Put the tree there. I want to just show you something that I noticed with this tree. Uh, I'll put it on the turn table if you see. Okay, if we now turn the tree around, the Japanese are very, very clever people. And I just noticed that they did a bit of grafting with the branch. If you can see that piece there, that was a branch that grew upwards and they took it there and made this branch with it. If I turn it around, you can see that's how it's done. Can you see, you can still see the branch there. 
So this is a bit of in-arching almost that they've done. They took a branch going from here, took it up there and took it out there. So not only have they thickened the trunk, but they've created a new branch by doing that. I've seen it done with some of the imported trident maples. They do a lot of that uh, using the branch to go to another level by like grafting, in arching, whatever you call it, it's very effective. Okay, so we will now put the wire in and then cut it, cut it up. Okay, so we're going to put a little bit of huga at the bottom, just in the center here. This is a large drainage hole and just a tiny sprinkling all over. And Hyuga is so light, it's almost like Kanuma, so that helps. Then we'll start putting the soil that we prepared. It's almost like a cookery program. Okay, now we'll put some more. Let's put the tree back in. So you can see we took hardly any root off. So we just put soil around. Are you going to tie it first or not? Maybe put some in first and then tie it. So you notice we always tie our trees in when we repot. Just a safety precaution. See, the tree is so healthy that it doesn't smell or stink or anything so everything is functioning well if the tree wasn't draining properly then this would become putrid some of you have asked can you use the same soil again i guess you could nothing wrong with it and this is a typical color of kanuma soil it's almost a yellow color but when you wet it, it will change color. When it's dry, it becomes almost white. I usually begin by prodding the soil in with just my fingers and then I will use the chopstick because the fingers can't go deep in so you see how much soil goes in when you use the chopstick. So chopstick, humble chopstick, a very useful tool. 